Let's go to our uh, Sunday school lesson. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 again. And uh, we don't make quick progress, but I'm not apologizing for it. There's a lot that can be discussed and considered and digested in just one verse here and there, or two verses here and there. So we won't get terribly far today. However, I hope it'll be helpful to you here and those watching later on. Matthew chapter 3, and we read through verse 6 last time. Let's read verses 5 and 6 again. Then went out to him, this is John the Baptist, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Confessing their sins implies a lot. And it gives the idea that confession of sins is some, has something to do with salvation of the soul in this age. And this idea has been exploited by the Roman Catholic Church to teach the sacrament of confession or penance, that you confess your sins uh, to a, a priest who then gives you forgiveness of those sins that you've identified to him. And by that forgiveness or by that penance in the confessional, you get a little bit closer and closer to ultimate salvation one day. And the truth is, if you ask an uh, ordinary devoted Roman Catholic who believes in his church, do you know for sure that if you died tonight, you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? Do you have that kind of certainty? And the answer Roman Catholics are taught to give is that, no, I don't know for sure. That is something that is up to God to decide. That's presumption to, to a, a claim, I know where I'm going when I die because you haven't died yet. It's funny that when you ask that question to someone, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anyone who's a Roman Catholic who may be watching our videos today, but when you ask that question to your Catholic friend or relative, and they give you the answer that, no, I, don't, I won't say that I know for sure because that's God's prerogative to tell me to decide ultimately who gets to heaven or who doesn't. They'll give you that answer, and yet when you hear their funeral and their eulogy by the priest at the Catholic Church, they are preached as though they were in Jesus Christ's presence and in heaven with the door shut behind them, no questions asked. And yet, if you ask them during life, do they know, they're taught to say no. Nobody can know for sure. And um, I've often also thought it was rather strange that the popes and the cardinals, in agreement with each other, will decide that someone who has already passed from this life into eternity is worthy to be made a saint that you can pray to. My boss can give me a raise because he has a higher status than I have, but I can't give my boss a raise, right? And uh, someone who has died and left this life is presumably farther along in the timeline than we are. They are gone beyond this life into the next life to see things that we only speculate about. So how is it that we can promote them in the life beyond? It always seemed rather strange to me. Anyway, back to our text. This idea of confession of your sins in order to be saved um, has been used and exploited by the Roman Catholic Church, and I suppose the Church of England or Episcopalians and others like them uh, by extension. Simply confessing and repenting and making restitution of your sin has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul in this age. Judas Iscariot did those things, and he still died and went to hell. Go forward, if you will, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, <clears throat> and notice there verses 3 and 4. Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, 
and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, here he is confessing, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. Look forward also at John chapter 17. John 17, and here in the Lord Jesus, great prayer for his disciples and his church. John 17, notice what he says in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Go also to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 20, verses 24 and 25. Acts 1 verses 24 and 25. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So he still went to hell, or more precisely, the bottomless pit, according to Revelation chapter uh, 17 and verse 8. There is a New Testament text that does connect confession of your sins to forgiveness. Let me show that to you. Go to John chapter, or rather, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1 and verse 9. John writes, If we, believers, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, believers, and to cleanse us, believers, from all unrighteousness. It has to do with maintaining your fellowship with God. Uh, but the person confessing already has a basis to expect forgiveness. Look there at chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not, believers. And if any man sin, we, believers, have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The one confessing already belongs to God. He's already saved. And notice what happens if you don't deal with the sin in your Christian life. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verses 30 to 32. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, or that they're dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So if you fail to confess your sins and judge the sin when you're aware of it in your life as a believer, then God's going to chasten you and correct you like a father would to a disobedient son. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son in whom he receiveth. Or rather, every son whom he receiveth. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 7. Keep your place at our text, and look what, um, look, notice rather how John's preaching is uh, recorded uh, in Mark 1, verse 4. Mark 1, verse 4. Mark writes, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. To be remitted or remission meant the pardon or the forgiveness of that sin but it didn't mean the removal of that sin. It was forgiven 
but it wasn't taken off of the person's record. It wasn't expunged from his record. The sacrifice of the animals in the Old Testament were unable to do that. They did not measure up to the man in value. They were um, done in obedience to God's command, and in so doing, the person's sin would be forgiven. But it had to be done again the next time. Confession and remission of sins here is also connected with water baptism by these two texts together. And this is another mistake still taught uh, among Christendom, so-called Christian churches, who, have, who don't know anything about rightly dividing the word of God. Um, as though the water itself was or is some agency in the cleansing of sin that somehow it's necessary to cleanse you of your sins. That was ceremonial and a ritual among the Jews. Look at, go forward to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. I know I bounce you around from a lot of scriptures uh, to other scriptures, but it's important to compare scripture with scripture and get a better uh, uh, picture of what's being described and what we're trying to learn here. Look at Hebrews 9 and a couple of verses there. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. And verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, and scarlet, excuse me, and scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And uh, verse... Verses 25 and 26. John 3, verses 25 and 26. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, meaning Christ, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. They're asking about purifying. Is it better for us to be baptized by you, or would it be better for us to be baptized by the one you pointed to and said he was the Lamb of God? Which one would cleanse us of sin, to be baptized by Jesus or to be baptized by you? That's Like I said, this was ceremonial. The Jews cared about washing of cups and plates and so forth, uh, cleansing themselves, even if they didn't, you know, they didn't, uh, uh, scrub under their fingernails and do those things. They would dip their hands in the water as a ceremonial act to show that I'm seeking to cleanse myself in the eyes of God before I carry out this sacrifice of this ordinance. And Peter preached this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent, therefore, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I talked to you about that little three-letter word, for, F-O-R. And it goes two directions. And unfortunately, too many people have pushed that word for in the wrong direction. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter says, Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And every Pentecostal, um, apostolic Pentecostal, church of Jesus, only oneness people, they think it means you get baptized in order to get your sins forgiven. But it means to repent in response to having been forgiven in the past. That's why I say four can go in two directions. When you, and the best way I can illustrate this is to say this very often, when you go to a fast food restaurant, you pay for your food before you get it. When you go to a sit-down nice restaurant, you pay for it after you eat it, right? So four can go in two directions. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, 
the Mormons have hit upon a verse that says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if so be that the dead rise not? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And they think it means to be baptized for your loved ones that died in the past, before anyone ever heard of Joseph Smith. But the truth is, it's a baptism for or in light of a future resurrection, those who trust in Jesus Christ. When we are baptized in water, we are illustrating a number of things. We're illustrating that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again in glorified power. We're also illustrating that if we die someday and our bodies decay in the grave, we believe Jesus Christ is going to raise them up and make them supernatural and glorified power. We also anticipate the day we uh, go to sleep or, go to, or die, rather, in the grave and uh, come back to life. And we are identifying ourselves with him. There's an old nature in me that just wanted to satisfy itself and serve and please itself. But now as a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to please Jesus Christ. I want to please him. We're illustrating those things by water baptism, but water itself has absolutely no power whatsoever to cleanse a soul of its sin. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. Some physical action cannot affect a spiritual change. It has to be done in the spirit uh, world between you and God. But Peter preached that, because that's all the light they had before any of the New Testament books were written. And he preached that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, to the Jews to be baptized as a response for past forgiveness, which they had taken for granted. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. And Peter's just about to preach it in Acts chapter 10 at the house of Cornelius, the first Gentile recorded to have gotten saved in his household. And he's just about to say that, but the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius' household. They began to speak with other tongues as a sign to the Jews that they, they had the Holy Spirit without any water baptism having taken place. So, unfortunately, Christianity, what's called Christianity, goes that far, and they seem to think, they go as far as Acts chapter 2, and seem to think that being baptized in water is somehow a necessary part of being born again and being saved and having your sins forgiven. They never followed Peter all the way into Acts chapter 15. Go over there for a minute, if you will. Acts chapter 15, and here the Jews are disputing uh, about whether Gentiles who believe should also be circumcised as Jews were to show that they are truly devoted to God. And the consensus was no. Circumcision uh, affects nothing in a spiritual relationship to God. But Acts chapter 15, and let's start there at verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That'd be circumcision and any other observance of Jewish law. Verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. No mention of water baptism in connection with someone's salvation at all. But like I say, unfortunately, too many people don't want to go that far with Simon Peter. They, they like the idea of uh, water baptism. They emphasize the symbolism, the water baptism, and know nothing about the substance, real forgiveness, and real uh, experience of being born again. They like the symbolism. Like I say, it symbolizes and represents a number of things when we do it as believers. And they, they want to dwell on that and ignore the real substance of belief and faith. That is the new birth and the forgiveness of your sins by trusting God alone by faith. 
confessing, confessing your sins to God. You know how that song, um, count your many blessings, name them one by one? Uh, it's impossible to list all the blessings you have. I mean, it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, reminder in that song, great sentiment. See how many things you can number and, and tally up and give God thanks for. But to be honest, it would be impossible for you to list everything that you ought to thank God for. And likewise, it would be impossible for you to list every sin that you ever committed that needs to be forgiven. The very idea that you're going to go and you're going to recount a list of sins you've committed to a Catholic priest and uh, think you need that to do that to get forgiveness is really laughable. First of all, you don't know everything you've ever done that counts as sin. When we think of how pure and how virtuous and how perfect and impeccable and absolutely flawless the Lord Jesus Christ was in thought and word and deed and gesture and the glance and the look of his eyes, everything about the Lord Jesus Christ was acceptable before the Holy Father in heaven. Everything. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the idea of someone who never stumbled in his private thoughts. Because you don't. I don't. Every single one of you in this room right now stumbled in some way. Whatever thoughts you had between the moment you woke up and the moment you got to church today. In some way. If you were honest with yourself. So it's very difficult for us to imagine someone alive in flesh and blood who was that pure, who was that undefiled, like the Lord Jesus was. And for some guy with a special turned around collar to say he's, he represents Jesus Christ and it's his right, his prerogative to grant you forgiveness of your sins is really laughable. The idea that over a billion people in the world have bought into that malarkey without, without referring to Joe Biden in the no malarkey tour. Uh, we won't get into that. It'll, it'll be nothing but malarkey. Let me put it this way. But anyway, the idea that a man has the prerogative and the authority to forgive your sins when you list them to him is really comical. First of all, you can't list them all, and nor does he have any authority to forgive you. He's got his own sins to worry about. So, back to our text, Matthew 3, verse 7. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There can be no doubt about the wrath to come. Go back to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, just a few pages back. Malachi 3. Malachi 3 and verses 2 to 5. Malachi 3 verses 2 through 5. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sor sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Look at Malachi 4, and verses 1 through 6. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. 
and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember me, excuse me, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. John is speaking of the second coming of Jesus Christ in glorious power to judge the world one day and to rule the world. And you might think, well, he was wrong. It didn't happen. No, he wasn't wrong. He was going by what God had uh, revealed and shown up to this time, or rather up to that time, up to that point. That's what God expects every man to do. Follow the light up to your day and age as far as you can and live faithfully uh, uh, by it. Sort of makes me think of the saying I, I said to you once about believing the King James Bible is the word of God from cover to cover. Wouldn't someone fare better at the judgment seat of Christ one day for having believed that this book was perfect from cover to cover, even if it turned out it wasn't, than someone who didn't think it was perfect and it turns out that it was? Wouldn't the first person fare much better than the judgment seat of Jesus Christ? Sure he would. And then the generation of vipers, in verse 7, is also suggestive. Go back to Job chapter 20. Job 20. Job 20. And let me start there at verse 12. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, Though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth, yet his meat in his bowels is turned, it is the gall of asps within him. He hath swallowed down riches, and he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. And Psalm 58 Psalm 58, and verses 3 and 4. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. So we see asps, vipers, serpents in connection with the wicked. And John knew exactly how to describe the Pharisees and those coming to his baptism out of curiosity. Also look at Micah chapter 7. Lastly, Micah chapter 7. I'll give you a moment to find that. It's not a book most Christians are looking at today. Micah chapter 7 and verses 15 through 20. Micah 7 verses 15 through 20. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. And the nations, excuse me, the nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Here God is promising the blessing upon the nation of Israel. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. How in the world could anyone say that all the promises to the physical, fleshly descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, 
are somehow spiritually transferred to Gentiles in the New Testament church who are born again by faith. The Jews still exist. Therefore, the promises God made to them, in spite of great efforts to destroy their existence, must still be valid. And God still intends to fulfill them. Even if you and I would be uh, unqualified to identify who is a proper Jew and accepted as a Jew in the eyes of God. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who could accurately do that uh, to God's acceptance. But we believe it to be true nevertheless. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that those passages we just read are all in proximity to some text concerning the tribulation or, or um, Daniel's 70th week, Jacob's trouble, and the second advent of Jesus Christ and the glorious return of Jesus Christ to restore the Jew to his place of prominence over the earth, over all other nations, all other peoples of the earth at the second advent. <clears throat> 